Hi, so uh, welcome back to our uh, lectures on uh, GPU architectures and programming. So we have been discussing this SIMT model of computation and uh, based on that how the different threads that are launched by a kernel on a GPU get scheduled and as we have seen that threads get packeted in the form of 32 parallel threads being executing together as what we know as warps and these warps are essentially getting mapped to the scalar processor cores and uh, the GPU's multi, multi, I mean multi level scheduler is responsible for scheduling these warps into the processor architecture as we shall see and so coming to warp execution as we have discussed earlier that for this specific GPU the SIMD warp scheduler selects one of the active 24 warps and accordingly this warp is executed and of course at a time there may be many parallel uh, warps that are active which also depends on the size of the SM and the size of the and the number of SMs in the system and all that. So how does we, uh, an, a warp really execute? So for the example system that we have taken here since one warp will have 32 parallel threads with and uh, ex being executing and uh, there are essentially 8 SD cores. So an issued warp will execute over 4 processor cycles and of course uh, there will be the SD cores which are comprising the integer ALU and, uh, and also the floating point units and also there are the special function units uh, which are separate from the SD cores and they are going to execute the corresponding instructions independently. So, Coming to the GPU's ISA, like what are the different kinds of instructions that are supported by the execution model of a GPU. So as we know that this is to be defined by the instruction set architecture of the graphics processing unit and the instruction set architecture specifies what are the different classes of instructions that are going to be supported. So it happens that there is support for lot of floating point uh, operations apart from standard integer and bit level operations. Also specific operations like transcend delta operations are supported and there are also specific instructions which control the flow of execution into the GPU. This is some topic that we will get in, in more detail later on. Of course there are also instructions for doing memory load and store of data points. Now what are really the floating point and integer operations that get executed? These are pretty similar to standard processor instructions with respect to addition, multiplication. There are also fused multiply add units. So you have one instruction which will do the multiply add. There are instructions for performing I mean minimum as well as maximum value extraction, comparison instructions and set predicate instruction. So that is something also which is very important with respect to instructions flow control that is also something we will touch upon in more detail later on. And also there are instructions which do the conversion between integer and floating point numbers. And as we have discussed earlier that we have inside the GPU apart from the scalar processors we also have the special function units which take care of executing the transcend delta functions. That means functions for which you, you do not have. Uh, uh, a, a, a nice closed form, but there are some, uh, I, I mean, this our standard numerical algorithms which would actually implement their approximate versions. For example, cosine transform, sine, binary exponential, binary logarithm. As we know that they, in terms of algebraic expressions, their exact values will require you to compute an infinite series of terms, but <coughs> inside the Inside a, inside a standard digital system, the way they are implemented is you have a numerical algorithm which does an approximate computation which is good enough in terms of the number of bits that are provided to represent the value. So you have transcendental function instructions for all the trigonometric functions, then binary exponential, binary logarithm, computing reciprocal as well as reciprocal square root. With respect to bitwise operators, you have the standard shift left shift right, logic operations and also move instructions. You can also do control flow execution 
you can actually have instructions of course you need them in any standard royal server and you need instructions which will manage the control flow that is managing branches bran managing function calls managing returns the trap and also something known as barrier synchronization that is very useful for handling parallel threads in in any kind of parallel programming interface it may be gpu or it may be mpi or something else so what about the register file like we know that in any processor you have a register file which contains the registers the registers hold the data which immediately next to the alus and so that for doing any kind of alu operation the operands have to be present in the register otherwise they have to be brought from the main memory through the cache so every sm has a large vector register file so it's like a vector processor these registers are divided logically across simd lens that is the sps so as we have seen earlier in our small discussion on vector processors you have vector registers that means a register which can hold an array of values of the same type so similarly like that i also have a big register file inside an sm and the registers are divided logically across the simd lens so the sps kind of represent the individual scalar compute elements of a large vector and then what are the values of the registers that is something that keeps on varying across architecture families with the older gpu architecture we had smaller numbers but with <coughs> the newer gpu architecture definitely the number of registers per sm keep on increasing we will have some figures on this later on now coming to the second architectural example so we move from tesla to the fermi family of nvidia architectures which provided some new facilities in terms of processing so coming to an example with respect to fermi gtx 480 gpu this is a representative example of the fermi family one of the earlier examples it has got 16 sms together they can process 512 cuda cores so you have this 512 cuda cores inside this 16 sms that means each of them has got 32 of these cuda cores 32 scalar processors and you have got this 32768 number of 32 bit registers divided logically across the executing threads inside each sm so i have each sm is comprising this 32 sps and this many 32 bit registers so if i look at the system from the perspective of a single simd thread it is limited to no more than 64 registers a warp has access to 64 times 32 registers of course inside a warp i will have 32 such threads since each thread has got an access to 64 registers when a warp is executing inside a gpu it has got access to this overall number of registers of course each of these registers are 32 bit so just to get to the values again overall i have this many number of registers for a single warp i have access to this 64 cross 32 registers each of which are 32 bits however they can hold different kinds of data types right i can use the 32 bit registers to hold 32 bit data also if i am doing operations on double precision floating point operands i need 64 bit data values so if i consider this kind of double precision floating point operands then i would start saying that a warp has access to 32 vector registers and uh, each of these vector registers have 32 elements and each of these elements are 64 bits wide so essentially this figure of 64 cross 32 this figure of 64 cross 32 registers which are 32 bit changes to 32 vector registers each of them are 32 wide so each of them is 32 the width is 32 so i essentially 32 cross 32 registers which are 64 bit wide the same register file can operate in both the modes so this is an example picture of a fermi family sm 
So, this is a streaming multiprocessor example from Fermi family. As we can see, the cores are all the SP cores can be seen here. So, as we said that each SM has 32 SPs, in total there are 16 SMs. We are having a deeper look into one of the SMs, right? So, inside one SM, I have this kind of 32 SPs. I have got this 32 SPs and there are 16 of the load store units which do memory load and store via the cache to the DRAM. So, each SM has got this 16 load store units. Essentially, this contributes to 16 SIMD lanes and each lane has got this 2048 number of registers. So, essentially, you divide this many registers across this 16 SIMD lanes. So, you land up with 2048 registers per SIMD lane. Each lane has got one load store unit loading data points from the from the DRAM. Now, if I look into the other functional units that are present in the SM, then I have got four special functional units as we can see that they are not directly integrated into this pipeline. So, I can see that a, if I look, if I can have an alternate look into this figure from an horizontal way, then I can start saying that okay, for every load store unit, I have got two cores here. That's like an one SIMD lane. I have got 16 SIMD lanes. These SFUs are sitting there. They are not directly integrated into each of these lanes, but of course, for operations, they are available. And I ha I can have in the best case four possible special function operations going on. If I take a closer look into each of the scalar processors, so that's the figure we have here. So, in this figure as you can see that you have got inside it. So, there is a dispatcher, there is a result queue and inside this CUDA code that is the scalar processor, you have one floating point unit and one integer ALU. So, these operations are supported by these units. You can have an integer operation, you can also have a floating point operation here inside the code. The ALUs also support standard boolean shift move compare convert kind of values extracting specific bit fields from an input value in a register and all that. So, that is about the computation part in the SM, right. So, I have this many compute cores inside the SM. Just to summarize, there are total 16 SMs. Each SM has got 32 SPs. There are 16 load store units, 16 SIMD lanes. This is the overall register file inside the SM and this register file gets divided across SIMD lanes. So, each lane gets 2048 number of registers and if I start looking at the point from the execution view of a warp, then a warp has access to these many registers which are all 32 bit. I mean, it, it has got access to these many registers out of this total but they can also be configured in a different way and I can say that it also has access to 32 vector registers, each holding 32 elements which are 64 bit wide. Now, coming to the memory hierarchy of the SM. So, as you can see, here I have the organization of the compute units. Also, there is something called a shared memory, but it is also written as an L1 cache with an oblique and the amount of it available is 64 kilobytes. So, what is the shared memory? So, in a memory hierarchy, the memory is organized from the programming point of view into the following parts. So, there is local memory per thread. So, this is the private temporary data which is booked per thread in the external DRAM. So, outside this set of SMs, I have one big DRAM here to which these things are connected through a interconnect. For computation by each thread in the SPs, we have a specific set of registers available as we have discussed that there is a specific set of registers available per warp. Inside, inside the warp, I have got a set of SP cores that are engaged. 
but of course those registers may not be enough to hold all the computation values the intermediate values that are getting computed in a per thread basis in case a thread is very computation heavy and it is generating lot of intermediate data which needs to be stored somewhere and the register files allocated set of registers for the thread are not enough then definitely you need to have space in the dram which can be used right for the storage of such data so this is known as the local memory per thread so essentially inside a, then every thread will have access to some segment of the external dram definitely since it is the dram the access is slow so this will happen the storage or the access to the local memory of the thread will happen when it is doing some local computation and the values cannot be okay, cannot be stored in the register there are too many things to store for the registers available to this thread then we have shared memory for low latency access to data shared by threads in the same sm so what is this shared memory now as we can see that the register file div gets divided in a per warp basis but suppose the threads across warps need to collaborate among each other they want to collaborate on computation that is going on for that you need something which is available here as a shared memory so this is the memory segment which is transparently visible to all the cores so somebody updating some data in this memory segment is visible to the other computing thread in any of the other cores so the good thing is the shared memory is sitting inside the sm so the access of the shared memory is very fast if i compare it with the access of the dram so if multiple threads executing across cores want to do some collaborative computation the good thing for them to do would be to have the certain data points defined as shared memory type data and access them of course register has the fastest access but next would be the access time for the shared memory so this shared memory is useful for low latency access to data shared by threads inside the same sm and then of course you may need lot of data for the threads to work on which is definitely sitting in the global memory and it is being brought into the system that is inside the sms hierarchy of shared memory l1 cache and the registers as and when required so this global memory for data is shared by all threads of a computing application and this is again implemented in the external dram chip of the gpu so uh, so just to summarize you have the global memory available for a cuda program defined as a space in the external dram chip of the gpu for per thread computation if there is something that has to be stored beyond the registers because the registers are already loaded and uh, then you also have some access to the local memory per thread which is basically private to the thread and that the physical location for that would also be the dram so as we can understand what is the difference between a dram segment which is a global memory and a dram segment that is a local memory the global memory is again shared by all threads so any update to any data point on the global memory is visible to all threads but the local memory is also something that is implemented in the external dram but it is defined in a per thread basis so any update done by a specific thread is going to be used by that thread only it's not going to be visible to the other threads so essentially how this memory model for cuda programs is organized you have a very high level dram Uh, there is a physical location where you have a global memory that is defined that is shared by all the threads and that is to be used for collaborating computation across sms because as you can see the shared memory is also sitting inside the sm in this way i have 16 more sms and all the sms update values final into the global memory so if i have to do some collaborative computation across sm threads across sm then that memory update has to happen through the global memory segment that is defined in the dram again i will repeat this part that local memory is also something defined in the dram 
but is defined in a per thread basis. It is used in a per thread basis. It's used for computation and holding of temporary values for that specific thread. And this is this is true for every thread individually. So for holding their temporary data, apart from the register file segment which is assigned to that thread, they have some segment in the local memory which is again physically located in the external DRAM. For faster prog for faster computation and collaboration among threads inside an SM, you have this shared memory which is allowing you low latency access if I compare the access time with respect to the global memory and this helps for sharing data by threads inside the same SM. So sharing data by threads across SM has to happen through global memory. Sharing data by threads inside the same SM can happen through shared memory because it provides a low latency access. For each thread in the SM, the fastest access of data happens to the part of register assigned to it. But if it needs more place for holding temporary data, it has to access some segment inside the DRAM which is defined as that thread's local memory. If we look into the specific memory hierarchy, starting from this Fermi family of GPUs, then there is something fascinating about the shared memory organization here. So if I look at the computation from the point of view of a thread, or if I look at the memory organization from the computation of a view of a thread, then the nearest to me is the register file, it is not shown in the figure. The next level is the shared memory or L1 cache. Then I have the L2 cache and then I have the DRAM. <coughs> so the good thing about shared memory is as if you can look into the figure, it is inside the SM. So if I have to do the computation inside the SM, two different cores are updating values and exchanging values across, them, across the, uh, themselves without crossing the boundary of the SM then there is no point in updating value to the global memory and then going to the other SM. Rather, it can be done through this shared memory, right, as we have discussed already. So that is what it enables. It enables the threads to cooperate, they, to facilitate reuse of on-chip data and reduce the off-chip traffic. By off-chip traffic, we mean the access to things that are outside the GPU chip, that is the DRAM. So uh, that is outside the processor. Now each SM will have 64 KB of on-chip memory. Now this memory is configurable. When I mean this on-chip memory, I mean this shared memory and L1 cache part. So this is 64 KB. As you can see, it's written here. Now as, since uh, we wrote this already, right? It's shared memory oblique L1 cache. The reason is this: it can be configured in two ways. It can be configured as 48 kilobyte of shared memory with 16 kilobyte of L1 cache. Or alternatively, it can also be configured as 16 kilobyte of shared memory with 48 kilobyte of L1 cache. So both things are possible. It depends on what really you want to do. If you need to have more amount of collaborative execution, then you would actually across the inside the SM, across the different CUDA cores inside the SM, then you may like to have more amount of shared memory. So taking a more distributed look into this memory hierarchy, so earlier whatever we have been discussing was specific to one SM like this one, there is the picture of the architectural block inside the SM. If you have a look into the memory hierarchy from the point of view of the entire GPU chip, you have all these SMs arranged here, right? and they are connected through this interconnect network. Each of the SMs contain inside them that shared memory, ordl one cache, that register file, the CUDA code, special function units, load to unit, everything, right? And you have all these SMs here. So this L1 data cache or shared memory fabric is private to the SMs along with some other memory segments which are the read-only texture and constant cache. So these are specific cache types which will also be located inside the SM. So the reason is you can always have specific variables 
which will you which your threads will be operating on in read only mode right so you can put them in the constant cache inside the sm for faster access and then you have the l2 cache while the l1 cache is private to the sms the next level of cache is not private to sm but the l2 cache is unified for all the sms so essentially you can think that this l2 cache they it's a unified thing so you have a common l2 cache through which all the sms can also collaborate the access to the dram has to be done through a memory controller from the l2 cache because of course if you don't get the memory element from the in the l1 you will access the l2 if you if the l2 cache also gives some miss then the memory controller will reference the dram so the l2 is unified across all the sms and the access to dram is actually banked by banked what we mean is the dram is not organized as a big chunk of a physical memory but is divided into multiple banks of memory and all these banks can be accessed in parallel so that's why we are saying that six high bandwidth dram channels are present so we show here six possible access places for the dram and we will of course come back to this topic of shared memory bank conflicts and how dram banks are accessed and all that later on so if i compare this idea of cpus and gpu architectures it can be quickly observed that gpus have a larger register file much larger register file with respect to cpu the reason is very simple gpus have got more number of cores inside them by cores i mean the parallel processing elements the basic computes the cuda cores and they do simple operations but lot of them together in parallel for sustaining that you need a very large register file to provide them with the requis requisite number of operands however if i compare the l1 and l2 cache size they are much smaller of course the l1 cache is divided across physically divided across the sms while the l2 cache is unified but they are much smaller but again they provide much higher bandwidth they provide much higher bandwidth if i compare with cpus coming to the instruction set target of the nvidia compilers so we have already discussed what are the instructions that are supported in general by gpus but what exact instructions are going to be really executed on the gpus so that specific set of instructions which are going to be executed in the gpu keeps on changing optimizing and possibly being refined by suppliers like nvidia so they do a different possible they implement a different possible approach in terms of defining the instruction set if i compare with cpus so what they do is from the programmer's point of view they define an instruction set which is the target of all nvidia compilers and this is something that doesn't change so this is the essentially an abstraction of the hardware instruction set because with change in gpu family the hardware instruction set goes through modification but the nvidia compilers or if somebody develops some other compiler they will uh, they need not always update themselves or conform to the ever changing actual hardware instruction set but they just need to emit code in a well defined abstract instruction set known as ptx ptx full form is parallel thread execution so this is the abstract instruction set that is defined for generating code and if you are trying to write a compiler for a gpu system you would like to generate code which is in the ptx format we'll go into details later on today i mean in as part of this lecture we'll just introducing this idea of ptx but then the question is finally it needs to be translated to hardware instructions well the ptx code gets translated to this instruction when it's actually loaded into the gpu so when the compiler emits the code you emit ptx code compiler optimizations they are also defined on the ptx code 
the ptx code format is something like this so you have an op code then you have a destination operand is followed by three possible source operands the source operands can be 32 bit or 64 bit registers or also a constant value now there is something interesting about these instructions each instruction can be predicated by a one bit predicate register which can be set by a specific instruction called set predicate instruction now this is a facility that helps to decide whether or not to execute an instruction based on some specific conditional that may be there in the program now this is something that handles that plays a big role in handling branches in gpus and that is something that is very that is very important because as you can understand you are trying to execute multiple instructions in parallel so how really you execute a branch depends because if you are executing a warp you have 32 threads progressing together in lockstep by lockstep i mean that you have i mean if i go to that older architecture example that we just gave so there we defined a warp executes inside four clock cycles each clock cycle uh, since because there are eight of the sp cores in that example but of course you can understand things may, things keep on changing with the evo evolution of gpu architectures so from a programmer's point of view it is very it, it is a good way to think that in a warp all the instructions that are executing in a warp are executing exactly in a lockstep. So all the threads execute the same instruction together. Next, they execute the next instruction together like that. Now, when these threads face a branch instruction, it may so happen that some of the threads, their thread IDs satisfy the branch condition. For some of the threads, the thread IDs do not satisfy the branch construction. So when that happens, then the GPU needs to handle which of the threads should make progress and which of the threads should not make progress. And this is something that is decided by the set P, the set predicate instruction. We will get into that later on. Thank you. So, we will end with this for, for, for the time being. And in the next le lecture, we will introduce something more in this regard. Thank you.